Hey guys, welcome to Talking La Liga. Uh, David Kalch here, Simon Harrison. And uh, we've already wrapped the games from Saturday, so now we're going to look at Sunday. Um, if you haven't checked out our Saturday review, please do. It's up there on our YouTube channel, so give it a look. Um, but Sunday, yeah, Sunday was an exciting day too in, in places. So we, we started off on the right note, didn't we? Um, it was a uh, real saucy dad. They got a 4 2 win in A Coruña against Depo, which was pretty impressive stuff. Yeah, I mean, a lot was said about it being a super Saturday, but I think this, kind of this game week, every, everything was interesting apart from Malaga against Las Palmas, which we yet to come to, recording this on a Monday. Um, but yeah, I mean, the game, I, I, it's kind of a case of two teams that can't defend, so maybe the fact it was 4-2 wasn't all too surprising. Um, but I think all the same, I think Deportivo will probably be a little bit annoyed that, well, for one, you know, they're conceding early yet again. And then for two, with Lucas coming back, maybe you know the fans and the players would have hoped that you know that little bit of, well, he's going to help on the pitch and he's going to help mentally. I think having a, a player of that stature come back, but it didn't quite translate into you know a positive result. And it's kind of when they could have gained so much momentum, it's kind of you know kept them simmering and kept them a bit unhappy with Mel that, at that kind of level still. I think. Yeah, I think the problem with Depo is you know I'm at this point on, on Twitter, but you know it needs reinforcing. I think. The fact that they put together this unbelievable attack, Adrian, Lucas Perez, and uh, Florian and Andone, who still who stayed at the club despite Premier League interest towards the end of the window there, so they've got them. But behind them, there's not really much there. There's potentially a team, you know, that would flounder around mid-table a lot to fight in relegation, and I think it really, really shows. Because I mean, the squad is good enough, I think, to be mid-table overall, but. Mel's in charge of it, and, and for me, they need a better coach to, to get the best out of these players. Yeah, it's a shame because I think the deal for Shah, two million euros, he could be one of the, the bargains mm. of the window, just in general, across not not just Spanish football. And Sydney's done general. well, hasn't he? So there's a good partner for him. So yeah. you think Shah and Sydney. But again, it, it just goes back to Mel. Like, you know, it's all well and good having these individuals, but I think if you don't create a system for them to excel in, you know, I think good coaches can make average players look that bit, like that bit extra you know special if like they put them in the right system basically. yeah yeah if you put in the right system then you know you can you can be a product of that and the problem with depo is i don't think they've got the right coach to do that to extract that for, bit more for me i think they're always going to play with this 442 because seemingly i don't know emre cholak is just out of the picture this season by the looks and it's mm. a shame because like he's a good player to watch he's enjoyable mm. to watch um, for me, I think they're always going to be using these orthodox wingers. It was uh, Katabia, they've got Bruno Gama, Bakali. I think they've got the type of wingers they have means that they're always going to be looking to attack with their wingers. And I think it leaves, you know, Guilherme, Pedro Mosquera. If Fede Valverde starts playing more, which I really think he should, it just leaves them a bit exposed, I think. Yeah. Because when, when you've got a lot of players that potentially don't have the best temperament, so if you were to start, say, with, with Bakali and Katabia out wide, and there's been that whole controversy about, you know, them on Instagram liking things that yeah, were sort of against Mel. Right, yeah. I mean, when, when you've got those players, are they really going to work for the unit? Are they really going to yeah. listen to instructions like they should? And then it, it kind of leaves, I think, that the centre midfield is just completely exposed. And, and, and that's when you're going to start seeing mistakes. You're going to start seeing teams overwhelm them. They were very easy um, to play through, I thought. In Real yeah. Sociedad, they found it extremely easy. Just to, just to a couple of passes and they were already through. You know, they, yeah. I know Real Sociedad's got some good players, but they played to them easily and that, that seems the right time to change on Real Sociedad because they yeah. won the game uh, they were very good in patches uh, yeah Mendy especially yeah both ends Man of the, of the match, field yeah. again you know it just shows he's one of the best midfielders in the league quite easily isn't he yeah and and the whole uh, his release clause yeah I yeah mean, it's, it's standard, not really justified yeah, yeah. is it um, but yeah I mean he, he kind of showed that you know you don't need to necessarily be the flashiest player to sort of mm perform and impress I mean that that one run that he went on I mean there was no there was not a trick in no. sight it was all pure change of pace change of body shape um, and obviously with the finishes as well I mean uh, Juanmi's goal brilliant yeah. again I mean he keeps proving and I think Eusebio is definitely gonna find it hard to now just consider Juanmi a super sub I think yeah. he's hit form right at the right time right when they're thinking right we've got I think post Vela I think he he's finally really stepped up I think he finally knows what type of player he is because I think for a lot of years nobody knew whether Juanmi was going to be a striker a second striker a winger potentially a tackle midfielder and I feel like now he's trying to he, he's sorry he's finally realised and under Eusebio guiding him he's finally found where you know to get the best of his ability yeah, I think I think in general it was just a, a solid performance. I, I think the only question mark for them is obviously with Raul Navas being out with that back injury. 
it, it's kind of been who would replace him. And I think after even the Diego Llorente's goal was you know a terrible uh, scuff, and it was probably the, the ugliest goal that you're going to see this season. I think just that little bit of you're not looking at your centre backs to score goals. I mean that's never why you're going to choose them, but mm. I think that little bit of confidence, that boost, it, it should really for me. I think he should play ahead of Aritz now. Mm. I think Aritz and uh, Odrio Zola they were kind of at fault for some of the goals. I think yeah. Aritz got caught underneath for Andone's goal. He kind of got yeah. caught underneath the flight of the ball. Um, I really think that now Eusebio's got to look and think Diego Llorente. He's got to start whenever Real Navas isn't fit. I play him as a, a true, you know, third choice centre back. I think the way they play, then I think Diego Llorente fits him a little bit better. Yeah, if they want to, he wants if he wants to progress that system because we've touched on Real Sociedad and we said they haven't really added much. So the players they have added, Llorente, need to help them progress, and I think he's somebody who can progress their style of play. It's good to see as well they've got a lot of youth products in that squad. We, we kind of talked about the fact that they maybe haven't brought in a lot maybe they haven't got the depth that the teams have got especially given they're in so many competitions mm -hmm. but you know you, you can always respect a team that likes to use their youth products that mm -hmm. likes to keep faith in those young players um, so I think all in all it's going to be interesting because Real Sociedad on their day they're starting 11 with the system that they play that they can match anyone but yeah. it's still the same questions that we had before I think can yeah. they maintain it at multiple competitions and how can these young players sort of step up yeah absolutely um, next up we had Real Sociedad's great rivals I think Bilbao they were at home, Sam Amez, against uh, Girona, who started the season really well, but Athletic prevailed, uh, won 2-0. Yep. Um, and it was, it was a good performance, yeah, it, it? was pretty comfortable, I think. I mean, one of the big things for Girona, they're always going to be playing on the counter-attack, whether they're home or away, I think. Um, and Athletic, they kind of scored twice and then just kind of shut up shop and didn't really play too much great football. Girona that, definitely weren't out of their depth, though, No, no, definitely not. I mean, I, I think everyone's going to know that when they go into Montalivi, they're going to have a tough game. Yeah. Um, and Girona kind of showed that their system, it, it can frustrate a little bit away from home. I think having the three at the back will always help them with retaining possession yeah. if they need to. Um, but in general, yeah, I, I think that Unai Nunez did, qu did quite well. He's coming along nicely. He's got yeah, he, he did well in terms of, you know, they, they've got Porto, his pace has caused a lot of teams yeah. problems so far but he didn't really have all too much of an effect. Stuani looked quite isolated. Mm -hmm. So I think all in all, I mean, Girona, you can... I, I really do like their midfield. I think that their back three, it was caught out for pace a bit with Iñaki Williams, but on the whole, you can see they're a decent unit. Um, it might just be that when they play away from home, that what they've got up top, if you know the pace of Porto doesn't work or Stuani doesn't get the service that he needs, is, is that where they kind of fall apart? I felt Stuani was a little bit isolated, yeah. and, you know, and I feel they need to get somebody close to him in the next couple of weeks if they don't want to keep losing the games that they have in the, like you know like this game like this you know in this manner so they need to get somebody up there i think with stoani because everything else i think they do look really organized the defense isn't too bad at all they've kind of got a good partnership with the uh, center back there growing so i think it's positive for them but um athletic they remain undefeated under zaganda yeah um, without really impressing all too much. no no they're just going along nicely but it was always the case in the valverde i thought i never thought that Athletic ever looked imperious, you know, but they sometimes just plodded along and they, they put a streak together of seven or eight games, you know, like that. And you can see signs of it almost here. And when you've got Munayin playing his best football of his career, yeah. and then you've got Anaki, who's just progressing fantastically. It's just, it's just a shame. If he can add maybe, if, if he leaves this season with 10 goals to his name mm -hmm. in the Liga, you're thinking that there's going to be a lot of clubs around Europe that are going to be very, very interested in him because he's got the pace, he's got the quick feet. Um, obviously, with his size, he's not going to be completely, you know, he's, he's going to be capable in the air to an extent. Yeah. I, I think just all in all, apart from this finishing touch, he's a really interesting option to have because he, he can fit a lot of different scenarios. He can play out wide on the right, he can play up top. Um, and, and I think sometimes you look at Athletic and you think that they might need his pace in behind. But I think it really showed his decision making, I think, was a little bit better yeah, this weekend. Yeah. I mean, some of the passes that he picked out. Um, and, and all in all, I think when you've got Adaris who's going to stick the ball in the back of the net and you've got Munayin mm -hmm. offering that little bit of end product that maybe he hasn't had so consistently before yeah. 2017, mm -hmm. and Yuki's in a good position to kind of pick these passes out and maybe you know start racking up some decent assists uh, assists at the end of the season. Yeah, I think so. I mean, a few people have said to me, like, why is he still there? Like, how come teams have not signed him? And I do think it's that goal, isn't it? It's the, yeah. the, the, lack, or the lack of goals. Um, and if he adds that to his game, then I don't think teams going to know. Because I mean, his clause is what fifty million euros. It's that's after a, that's the summer we've had. It's nothing crazy. It's, to pay it's really not. You know, and Athletic are probably going to be looking at that and thinking, right, we have to do everything we can to keep him, and they're going to have to put up the eighty or ninety. I think probably yeah. at the end of the day. Um, next up, uh, we had you know it was, a, it was a decent game. It was only one nil. Celta Vigo beat Deportivo Alaves, but Celta were decent, weren't they again? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's really good to see that Maxi Gomez is settling in quickly. Mm. Uh, it's good to see uh, Stanislav Lobok. Uh, Radoya obviously not being uh, included in that match squad. Yeah. It was good to see that Lobaka was immediately given a position that was of real importance, rather than maybe letting him play in the roles that Hazabed have played in, maybe um, giving him the role that he's had coming into games late. It's quite nice to give Lobaka that responsibility because yeah. I haven't seen a player at Celta with that responsibility in terms of dictating the team in, since Augusto Fernandez before he went to Atleti. I thought Celta was kind of his team, everything went on his tempo, and obviously Aspas is such a massive figure, but he's not somebody who who runs the game for Celta and Lobotka showed that he has the personality to perhaps do that. Yeah, I think it's I think it's definitely a great player to have because he sort of linked everything together, everything was very calm, composed and it, it's good to just allow Iago Aspas to kind of, he comes alive when they get into the final third yeah. and you can kind of, he, he with a player like Lobotka playing in midfield and, and linking things together, you can kind of have Aspas, you know, confident that he's going to be able to make an impact in the final third because, you know, he's got someone who's reliable to kind of make sure the transition worked well. Uh, um, it's good for uh, Aspas ahead of him as well, I think, as well, to know that Maxi Gomez is around the score. Yeah, and yeah. the burden isn't on Aspas to continuously... Because I think sometimes Aspas tries... To, I mean, he is a very good player, Iago Aspas. But sometimes he tries to beat three or four men, engineer an opportunity for himself, or just put the final pass on. And he doesn't really have to do that now because I think he's got Maxi Gomez there. And I think Celta are now in a position where they can sling in crosses and Maxi Gomez is probably going to be in the right place at the right time just yeah. to flick it in. I think what's what's also useful as well is that Maxi, over the first two games maybe that Celta played, you had this impression that he's just a, a pure just finisher. But I think against Alaves he kind of showed that there's a bit more to him than that. I think. He had a lot of back he to can, goal. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think he can definitely you know switch the ball out to the flanks, which is obviously useful given that Celta, they're not afraid to you know allow Hugo Meyer to go off marauding down the right-hand yeah. side. And, and just all in all, I think they look just quite well balanced. I think Hozabed, he's still disappointing for me. He kind of, he was an absolute nearly player this weekend because he he was inches away on a couple of counts of, of you know, walking away from that game with two goals in yeah. his back pocket and everyone thinking, oh, Hozabed really turned up today. But it didn't quite work for him. Um, I think but, he's out the team soon, especially with Emery Mar coming in as well. And yeah. I mean, his place is probably going to be for grabs, really, isn't it? Yeah, well, there's that. And there's also the fact that Radoya, when he comes back in, does, um, doesn't do a C, you know, Radoya holding that deep midfield role and allowing Lobotka more likely yeah. to get forward. And I think right now that looks like the most interesting and exciting option. It really does. Yeah. It'll be interesting. I don't know. I can't believe that was their first points of the season because they, they've shown a lot, I still think, this season. Uh, Selden. They just had a few problems teething problems I think with the system and playing out the back um, as we saw in the next game <laughs> with Real Betis oh yeah. Uh, yeah yeah exactly so Real Betis they started off on a fantastic note they took the lead against Villarreal but they ended on the end of a thumping really wasn't it they're just kind of you always know that with Setien the way he likes to play out from the back you're going to see Setien goalkeepers with egg on their face from now and again yeah 25 I mean, like, good minutes for me 25 very good minutes I thought Betis where they, where they looked very really, they, they'd gone to El Madrigal and they looked very confident and they looked like they were the home team. And I know Villarreal's lacking confidence, everything that's going on with the Scraber, which we'll touch on in a minute. But they looked really, really good. And then after the goal, maybe 10 minutes after the goal, they were okay. They just faded completely. I think the problem is with the, the way that Setien likes to play is that if they just get caught too deep, then it all kind of just unravels a little bit for me. And I think when you it, they kind of brought on Guadalajara quite late, given the fact that he went away with Mexico. And and he's one of the players that you look to to really switch the play and bring them yeah. on the field quickly. And and I, I think when you've got, you know, Javi Garcia likes to play things fairly simple and maybe ping a ball to his fullback, but he, he's not going to play something massively expansive. Mm -hmm. And Camarasa as well is not really that kind of player. I think he's more comfortable driving with the ball. Than, I was going to say, it's Sean, it's Sean with Camarasa because I don't think he's fit. In. Well, there was the concerns throughout pre-season with uh, Camarasa as well that he wasn't really working. And again, and it showed for me that it didn't because I thought Navi has had, uh, had quite a decent game. You know, others are showing up in pre-season. A couple of the younger Betis players showed Camarasa up and he's yet to really show himself. I think, I think sort of the fact that he offers, he, he likes to drive with the ball, he's neat on the ball. Um, but I think for Alaves last season, the Pellegrino, he was almost more of a, a secondary striker at times. Mm -hmm. He would almost go up with Deverson and play and press as though he was part of a front two. And I think that when you know when Betis are kind of in control of games and they're camped in the opposition half and moving the ball, I think that's where Camarasa, you know, his extra bit of physicality is something that's going to be very useful. But when they're playing counter-attacking football and he's not going to be getting you know the service where he can drive and make things happen himself, and it's kind of you know more patient build-up play. Yeah. 
I don't really see what he offers, to be honest, because if he's inside his own half, it's hard to see, you know, how he's going to be the link that they need. I, I think if they're playing, you know, against a team that they really feel confident they're going to dominate, they're going to sit, they're going to get on the front foot, they're going to sit in the opposition half, then yeah, sure, he, he's a great player to have, you know, at the back post to find. Yeah. You've got Demisi on one side, Barragan on the other, they love to put the ball in. Joaquin's been putting some good balls in too. I mean, Camarasa, you'd want him in the box then. Yeah. But in games where you're not guaranteed to be spending that much time around the opposition penalty area, that's when I think maybe you can look at the squad and think there's people, you know, there's players that are more suited, I think. Yeah, and I mean, in terms of Villarreal, you know, like, did we see a massive improvement in Andy, think? Oh, we're concerned what's going on with Escriba. So basically, Escriba, you know, we've, we've spoken about him before, he's kind of under fire constantly at Villarreal. The fans haven't really taken to him. Um, he was booed when his name was read out in the Tanai uh, last night before the game was even started um, and they've only played three games you know like it's just incredible really isn't it I mean I can understand that there's long-standing ill feeling or just distaste at how they've played football under a screamer but they've had so many injuries it's not fair for, for me, me it showed that the players really really like him because they could have just laid down and died after that, yeah, that yeah. early goal was a huge test I thought you know the fans then the players went silent and then they could have just laid down and you know and took that and thought right we'll get a screamer out and I've seen it before many times in Spanish football and in terms of where the players have said, right, that's it, we want this guy out anyway. But I think Villarreal showed a lot of fight. Yeah, I mean, there were some, definitely some good performances just in general. I, I thought that it, it made such a huge, huge difference to have Alvaro and Victor Ruiz back as like a, mm -hmm. a recognised central defensive yeah. pairing after, you know, yeah. Semedo and Endai got completely taken apart by Real Sociedad. Mm -hmm. um, I think... I think Rukovina stepped up slightly. I was kind yeah. of hoping that Mario would be back fit to play at right back, but ah. I thought... You know, Rukovina wasn't too bad either. Uh, Sam Castillejo, though, obviously the goal was the cherry on the cake, but even if he hadn't have scored that goal, he was unbelievable. He was I thought. good. He, it, it was like the ball was, you know, Velcroed to his boot. Yeah. He, he was beating players at will. He was playing with such confidence and such freedom. Bob up for a few yeah. shots as and, well. And, and it was, it was against Dimitri as well. And I mean, Dimitri, at, at times, he did really well to dispossess mm -hmm. him and stuff, but yeah. there was just so much opportunity for him to get the ball and drive and be positive. Yeah. I mean, it was just great to see because he's had his injury problems. It's kind of, you know, upset his momentum last season. Mm -hmm. And hopefully now he can stay fit. And if he plays like he did last night, I mean, there's going to be clubs interested in January, definitely. I mean, He's got so much ability to give, I think. Yeah, exactly. And I think just touching back on Escriba and Villarreal, I mean, as a whole, I think they just need to get through this spell and then get Bruno back, don't they? And then once Bruno's yeah. back in the team, that's a big presence in the dressing room. And then the starting eleven as well. And, you know, you'd expect them to maybe kick on a little bit more after that. Yeah. I just think this is it. Yeah, I think everything centres around Bruno. You've obviously got the fact that they've got their third-choice goalkeeper, which, you know, is never ideal. Mm -hmm. And then also, I think once Bruno's back, that that's when I think Escriba can really start to see what's my best front two because yeah. right now obviously he's going with Bukambu he's going with Baka Baka with that goal as well which would be good for his confidence yeah. and then uh, Onyal came off the bench and scored which is also good for his confidence but it's interesting because all there's, I don't really see when you look at those three players I don't really see a combination where I think that's definitely the first choice one I think it's going to be very situational yeah. so, so I think it's quite interesting because Onyal is a young player he scored a lot of goals last season and he'll want to keep that momentum going but I don't know, I think Escriba, once Bruno's back, as you said, that's going to be huge. And then that's, I think, when the fine-tuning comes in, and that's when fans find out if really Escriba is just not for them at all. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if they kick on. Um, that's all for now, guys. Uh, short and sweet. And we'll be back this week, and our bonus pod will be looking at the Champions League games uh, this week, because there's quite a lot of Spanish interest there. Um, so we'll be chatting about that, so do join us.